the kind of cool thing is you wake up, it's the first day of July uh, in this alternate universe that we're living in, but that July 1st signals that the players are back. Uh, and, and hopefully, like you said, we're, we're going to start looking at these 60 games coming up. Now it's 40 divisional and then 20 interleague games. And, and of course, everything's being kept geographically close. So those original dates of going to Texas, going to California, obviously those aren't going to happen anymore for Baltimore. But I mean, when you're looking at the schedule, uh, what stands out to you so far about the things that are in place? Obviously, we don't know who and, and when we're playing yet. Right. First, I'm making sure I don't have a way shake mustache. Am I okay? All right. Good. You're good. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks. Just, just keep, keep me posted. Uh, just signal to me if it starts getting bad. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they have to play all the teams in the East in both divisions. Of course, now it's like, as if, you know, they can't catch a break. This rebuilding club in the pandemic has to play the hardest two divisions, really, in baseball. Uh, but yeah, the travel is going to be limited. Uh, they will have to take some flights, but you know, they can make some bus trips for some of the other cities. And we're still waiting for the schedule to come out. That should be early next week. I had heard a while back they wanted to wait until the camp started. And I'm sure Major League Baseball, it's, there's already a schedule out there. The Players Association had to review it, of course. And then plus, they're still checking to see what the situ situation is in different states where the virus is spiking again, Florida, Arizona. I mean, you can tell how much this changes. It wasn't that long ago they were theorizing maybe all the teams would have to play in Florida and Arizona and maybe Texas. Now it's like, I don't know if we can play any games there. So they've got a schedule kind of tentative, but they're still having to work some things out, make sure it's safe and he stays. And I'm sure the Orioles are checking to see when the Ravens are playing because you can't have a home game in the, both ballparks or both stadiums because of the shared lots and everything else. They probably have to work around that as well. So there's a lot of things that they still have to deal with. But yeah, 60 games, 40 in the AL East, 20 in the NL East. And hey, maybe a team in the second year of its rebuild ends up being a in the playoffs, we can ask Mike Elias, is the rebuild over or in the playoffs? And he'll be like, no, it really isn't. We just happen to get in the playoffs. But it's just so fun with this year when you kind of throw everything out the window to be like, I mean, they could make a run. <laughs> yeah, it takes one hot Maybe month no. and you're in it. Or one bad month from a team like the Yankees or whoever you expect to be a contender of the Nationals to ruin their season. So really... It is so important to start fast now. You know, they always say baseball, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a little more like a sprint now. So I guess if you're trying to find the positives in this kind of a weird summer, weird season, it's the fact that it's kind of going to be like a playoff atmosphere from day one. It's like you, you can't afford to – I always tell fans to calm down. There's like a four-game losing streak. They act like it's the NFL. I'm like, pace yourselves. Well, now a four-game losing streak can just knock you right out. So in that regard, it's going to be pretty interesting. Do you think the way that pitching is treated just for this season maybe uh, changes a little bit? Or, or do you think there's still going to be those pieces intact, especially when you talk about guys having to ramp back up to right. that ability? Yeah, I think at least early on there's going to be different. Because even though guys have been working out at home, and a lot of them have been able to, to face batters at different facilities, like David Hess, it was at the Red Sox Class A affiliate in South Carolina, Greenville, that they were able to actually use. And he was able to pitch to some guys. Richard Blyer said he's pitched to a bunch of players like Paul Goldschmidt, who took him deep, apparently. He wasn't thrilled about that. But even so, you can't expect a starter at the beginning, hey, try and give us seven innings, try and get up to 100 pitches. It's going to be even more gradual now, I think, with the stop and starting up again. And you can carry some extra pitchers now. They already were going to have 13 in a 26-man roster. Now you got a 30-man roster. You can add a few more so you may get a little bit more of, hey, try and get us through three or four. We'll go to this guy. We'll go to the, whether you're passing the baton a lot or you have a bulk type guy, a, a Hector Velasquez, or if it's David Hess, if it's whomever, to cut, try and cover some innings for you. And then maybe you can manipulate in the late innings like you normally would, bring in your setup man and whoever your closer is. But I think they're going to be real cautious at the beginning, though I'm sure there are plenty of pitchers that are going to say, I'm fine, just leave me out there. But we're going to have to be smart about this. But, yeah, the days of the four-man rotation and Jim Palmer and those guys giving you 300 innings and only 20 complete games, it's like a down year. I mean, I, I challenge everybody who never got a chance to enjoy Jim Palmer's career, go to baseballreference.com and just scroll down year by year what he did, ERA, innings, complete games, shutout, strikeouts. It's pretty amazing. We know that at the end of the day, uh, come the 23rd, the 24th, it will be 30 
men. Um, there's there's multiple catchers, and there's a pretty big infield selection for that tentative Orioles list right now. Uh, are there any names between those two sections that stand out? And you say, okay, these guys are definitely the ones who are who are locked in to make that initial thirty cut. Yeah, it's like we have to go back and remember what we wrote in March. A lot right. of that got <laughs> torn up and put or put in the shredder. Some of it still holds. Like we thought there'd be two utility guys, one like super utility, like an Andrew Velasquez who can play the outfield as well as the infield, and then a Pat Valeka who, by the way, hit like three thirty three with. But he have three home runs that he plays everywhere in the infield. Those two guys seem like they were locks. Now you can take an extra utility guy, I would think, at least one. So is that Richie Martin? Who, remember, Richie was ticketed for Norfolk, even though they hadn't decided that yet. We knew he was going to play shortstop every day down there. Well, now there's no minor league season. So do you keep him on the taxi squad or whatever they're going to do in that alternate camp, have guys, you know, inter-squad type games and workouts? Or do you keep him in the majors, maybe he sits quite a bit, but at least he's that extra guy. Is it Stevie Wilkerson, who we know can play anywhere and pitch, uh, do everything except probably catch, and I know he would do that if they ask him. So you have no more guys in play now who could be make the club that we've assumed weren't going to before. Uh, outfield, you know, that's still kind of, we didn't think DJ Stewart was going to be available. He had ankle surgery in October. He was supposed to be on the injured list. And now he's perfectly healthy. He might be the starting right fielder with Trey Mancini not playing this year. That's how weird this has been and how long it's been with this layoff. Guys who were supposed to be on the injured list now may be on the opening day roster. I've always been more of, of aligning with the purist side of the game when it comes to this stuff. And personally, I kind of love watching pitchers hit, although I get why they would implement that for this right. year. Um, but but what are your thoughts on on those changes? And, and do you think that's something that they're going to try to to bring around for the regular season in the years to come? Yeah, well, certainly the universal DH was supposed to carry over to next year until the sides couldn't agree. They said, forget it. We'll just focus on it for this year. I still think we're kind of heading there. For me, it's just I just want them to all be on the same page. I never got that. you. It's the majors, but the NL plays by one set of rules, the AL by the other. It's like in the NBA, the Western Conference doesn't have the three-point shot, but the East does it. Or in football, the AFC has the two-point conversion, but the NFC doesn't. Like, we should all be playing under the same rules, whatever that rule is. I just feel like it's silly to have two different. So just agree on something. Extra innings, yeah, I'm not necessarily thrilled by put a runner at second. But you know what? Selfishly, I'm not thrilled with covering 16 inning games either. So if it speeds up the process, that's fine. Maybe we should just say you're going to play at a certain point, just have a tie. Then it becomes like the NHL to get half a point for a tie or I don't know how that would work. But mm -hmm. uh, I get why they're going to do that. I would hope that that's only for 2020. The minor leagues, I get it more because you can't burn out an entire pitching staff at yeah. AAA. And then all of a sudden the major league club says, hey, we need to call up so-and-so. And the poor manager's like, I used everybody. No one's available. Like there's a reason why you want those games to end relatively soon as opposed to the majors. So I think that's just going to be a 2020 thing. And, the strategy, I guess, is you start with a runner at second, you butt him to third and hope for a sack fly or a ground ball to the right yep. side of the infield. It's going to be strategic. So a lot of guys are going to have to work on their bunning even more than they usually do. You uh, you nailed it there. Because I have to say, we uh, our opening day in 2015, the game that I called was an 18-inning game. And it was kind of like, if this is setting the mark for the season, I, I don't know that, <laughs> that I can make it. Um, and then once we saw the rule, that's exactly what happened is, is people figured it out and it became very rhythmic. You know, you, you always bunted and then you just saw it from there. And I, I don't think we've exceeded 13, 14 innings uh, since. But again, that's the minor league. So it, it does play a little differently down there. With, again, limited season, who's one person you think in particular who's really going to take advantage and, and whether that's standing up to expectations or surprising expectations, just blow the season out of the water. I'd say one guy to watch for me is Hunter Harvey, because the big thing with him, people already were saying he's going to be the closer in 2020. And I'm like, well, you know, first of all, let's face it, for rebuilding club, closer is not your number one concern. <laughs> like you would love to have a lead in the ninth inning, but mm -hmm. honestly, that's not what you're is worried about. But the thing with him, and I had to keep reminding people, is he's never – When's the last time he's gotten through a full season healthy? Even last year, he took a huge step, but they did shut him down in September. The arm wasn't bouncing back. He wasn't hurt, but he'd build up enough innings or like, why push it, especially when they weren't in contention. Well, now in a 60-game season, you should be able to get Hunter Harvey through that and, make, and you know, don't have to 
have the shackles on him. They've talked about and they can just turn him loose now. They're careful with everybody. But with him, it's not so much the injury pass that they're going to be worried about now. So it's like, go ahead, 60 games. Maybe, you know, you can use them more back-to-back games, perhaps. Things they weren't willing to do before, they can push them a little more. And you would like to think that after 60 games, he's still going to be going strong. Maybe we'll get more of an idea of what his stuff is, how good it is, how it plays in the majors. Someone who can really take advantage of the fact they made this list uh, to develop and, and, you know, not really focusing in on on the numbers and what's going on. But it's like we said earlier, they they have pr- pretty much the toughest schedule alignment for right. this year. And and while that's going to be a lot of growing pains, you know, how how better of a way to get better than playing the absolute best day in and day out. So who's who's the big development for 2020? Yeah, I mean, they're eventually going to, I think, funnel some of those prospects that Ryan Mountcastle eventually will be in the majors. Keegan Aiken eventually be in the majors. Those are two guys right there who, you, you know, you're going to, they're big parts of this rebuild and they're going to get that opportunity, not right away, but you'll work them in and certainly you'll start the service clock, you know, a little later. But uh, those are guys that's going to be exciting to see what they do, even in whatever sample size that is. But then otherwise, again, I'll bring up DJ Stewart again, because I'm not saying he's running out of time. But this is his opportunity. If he is the starting right fielder, you run him out there and just see what you've got with him and whether he can be an everyday guy in the majors or whether he can at least be an extra outfielder with uh, the two corners. You know, this is an opportunity now for him when we thought it was going to be delayed because of the injury. So maybe he seizes that job, whether it's right field or left field. Anthony Santander made big strides last year, but still needs to get the on-base percentage up. He tends sometimes to fall back into the bad habits and they have to work with them. This can be, again, a full season with him every day, whether it's left or right, and see whether he is a guy who can be a, a full-time guy in a corner outfield spot. Because eventually that first-round pick who signed yesterday is going to be in right field probably. So, And maybe sooner rather than later being a college guy. So these other corner outfielders may want to go ahead and seize the other spot or they're going to be on the bench or somewhere else. Looking at this trade deadline, you know, they did impose that there will be one probably a month into this shortened season. So you're going to be at the halfway point. But we're in a time where we're already trying to limit travel and and limit exposure and and everything else that goes around with that. How big or small do you see that trade market being this year? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be as active as it has been in the past. I mean, some teams perhaps, but, you know, for different reasons. First of all, because it's something like, you have to be on the 60 or something like in order to be involved in a transaction. So minor league prospects at the lower levels don't come into play. Uh, Is there enough time for a guy to really establish his value that it's, and then will a team want to take on the rest of a contract? It's not just for this year, but in future years, if you're trying to move a guy who's making more than you want to pay, but in a season with all this lost revenue and we don't know what 2021 is going to hold, Maybe teams are going to be like, look, I don't want this guy on my books right now. So I just don't think there's going to be as much activity as usual. I wasn't even sure if there was going to be a trade deadline. Certainly yeah. July 31st wouldn't have worked. So, or, you know, so at least they pushed it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and then to set rosters, it's now September 15th that a guy has to be on the team in order to be eligible for the postseason. So everything's been pushed back. I just don't think it's going to be as busy as it has been. How do you keep the energy going when you might need it and you don't have that atmosphere to to kind of pull from? Yeah, and obviously, you know, the fact that before it was, you know, one game that you didn't have the fans, now it's going to be perhaps the entire season. And yeah, you're going to have to kind of be able to motivate yourselves. I know some people say, well, attendance has been down, so it's not like they've been, you know, packing the ballpark every night, but there's still an energy no matter how many people are in the seats that you're not going to have now. And it is bizarre to have it that quiet. And it's going to be different, too, because guys are going to be spread out more. Uh, you know, players can't be as close as they normally have been in the dugout. They may be sitting in the stands. So everything's going to seem weird. So, yeah, you're going to have to really be more of a self-starter. Guys going to be reporting later to the clubhouse than they used to because they're under orders to do so. And as soon as that game ends, they'd really prefer guys got out so they can disinfect everything again. I think they are allowed to shower at the ballpark. That did change. But I don't know how many guys are going to do that. But it's basically like get in there, shower, get out. You're not going to have all those bonding sessions that you normally have. Guys playing cards, chess, or sitting around just talking, watching yeah. TV, watching late the West Coast game. They're going to be getting out of there. So, yeah, you're, they're going to have to really motivate themselves. And I would hope for a lot of guys it is going to be 
hey, maybe we have a shot to make the postseason in 60 games. Or, hey, I'm auditioning for a job, so I have to be at my best every night because I have a chance here. And, you know, looking ahead to who might be, you know, competing for spots in the future, they may want to seize that opportunity. Is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to the most in seeing this year, whether that's the wacky or just just getting back to it? Yeah, I think mainly it's just getting back to it and seeing how we're going to be able to, to cover this season. Because like I said, it's going to be just press box, masks, and Zoom calls. So does the novelty wear off at some point? Again, I'm making this about me again. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> uh, where I'm like, why am I sitting here sweating in this mask for a game and then going home to do the Zoom or staying here to do it and then getting kicked out like an hour after the Zoom ends? Will we still show up in person for every game? But yeah, I think it's going to just be you know, how the competition is in this kind of a setting and look for different things. Can Chris Davis carry over what he did in camp? It's been a long layoff, but if he sticks to what he was doing, and I assume he still bulked up that extra 20 pounds of good weight muscle. Can he go ahead and pick up where he left off or not? And if he can't, is everybody going to say it was because of the layoff? That's a terrific excuse. Or maybe he just was going to fall back into bad habits before. So let's see that that carries over. Can John Means build even more on what he had done before? Hunter Harvey, does Michael Givens make himself a trade chip? You know, guys like that, Rio Ruiz has a chance to seize a third base job and had a really good camp. Can he do that? You're just going to pick out different things. Watching Jose Iglesias play shortstop should be a lot of fun. The guy's plus plus defender. So that could be, you know, Austin Hayes. Is he ready to be the everyday center fielder? He didn't have a really good camp, but the key is so toolsy and he's, you know, they think he's the guy. Let's see what he does. Santander. So there are a lot of individual storylines. Can Alex Cobb stay healthy enough to maybe be a trade chip or at least just get through the season? Things like that. I love it. I love it. You're getting me excited already. And we still <laughs> got to wait another three weeks to see anything. Right. I'm, I'm all about it, though.